Hi everyone, I'm Grace uh, from Spicebox. Um, just to give you a brief introduction as to what we do, um, we make kind of fresh, vibrant Indian food. Uh, we do dishes such as jackfruit jalfrezi, tandoori cauliflower steak. We started about a year and a half ago. I'll come to that in more detail. We've got a stall in Camden. You can find us there seven days a week. And we've just launched our first delivery only uh, delivery kitchen in Canary Wharf in partnership with Deliveroo. So if any of you live in Poplar or Bow or Canary Wharf or Limehouse, you can get us delivered to your door for 12 weeks only. So make sure you order soon. So today's topic is obviously all about entrepreneurship. Um, when I asked Damien what I should talk about, he was uh, helpfully gen general about it. Um, but I kind of was thinking, you know, what is an entrepreneur? What does entrepreneurship even mean? It's quite a vague term. I don't often refer to myself as an entrepreneur because I find it a slightly kind of embarrassing um, phrase to use for myself. Um, but I suppose that this whole evening is to give you an insight into what it's like being an entrepreneur. And um, I'm sure many of you in the room are already entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs. And hopefully I'll kind of shine a bit of a light on what it is like to kind of set up and run a business. Um, I'm also going to, I'm going to keep it kind of casual. I'm going to talk you through my story and then I'm going to leave a decent chunk at the end for questions because I think it's probably most useful if you've guys got specific questions to, to ask me and then I can maybe help you a bit. So just if you think of questions as I'm talking, make sure you make a note of it because I don't want to have that awkward 10 minute gap at the end where no one wants to put their hand up. Um, so yeah, so, um, so when I was thinking about entrepreneurship, I was thinking, so we live in a time at the moment where everyone is told that they can be an entrepreneur and anyone can set, set up a business. And that's obviously because with the democratization of technology and information and marketing, it's easier than ever. But I also think that's actually quite a dangerous um, standpoint because uh, first of all, I think it, it glamorizes entrepreneurship to a certain extent. Um, and it also, I think people have to understand A, how tricky it is and difficult and horrible it is at times, which I'll come on to. Um, but that also, not everyone has to be an entrepreneur. You can be a really successful business person and not an entrepreneur. And for every one entrepreneur, you need a hundred different supporting people around you um, who can input in different ways. So I just think that's just kind of, you know, set the tone for tonight. Um, I think that's an, also an interesting angle. And if you're here and you don't think you want to be an entrepreneur, but you want to work in startups or something, I think that's, um, it's important to, to value that as much as wanting to be an entrepreneur. Um, so, my story. So this is me at university. So I um, didn't always know that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I grew up thinking that um, it was my life's calling to be a T4 presenter. Um, and then T4 got binned when I went to uni and then my dream shifted to being a Radio 1 presenter. So um, when I went to UCL in London and studied English and um, I threw myself into student radio, um, I got stuck in from day one and I spent most of my university life in the radio station and in the library, uh, which was very cool, um, because I kind of treated... I suppose like I treat my businesses now, I treated university as an opportunity and a challenge and I worked my ass off um, and I, I got what I wanted out of it. I'm not naturally that academic, but I came out with a pretty good degree and I uh, worked my way up in student radio and, um, you know, as a result of that, probably sacrificed a classic student lifestyle. I didn't go out that much. I had some really good friends from uni, but not loads. Um, didn't have many relationships. But um, I thought this would be a good starting point because it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, my kind of how my mindset was beginning to kind of shift into that of entrepreneur. Um, so when I got to my third year of, of university, uh, I realised I couldn't be a Radio 1 presenter because uh, my voice was too posh, sadly. And um, I also realised that I didn't want a job. All my friends were applying for internships and, um, and I realised that I couldn't think of anything worse than leaving university and going to work for someone. And that's when I kind of suddenly realised that, OK, maybe I want to do my own thing. I had an amazing idea for a black and white fashion business um, that I will do one day. Um, um, but that was the point at which I was like, OK, I'm going to leave university and I'm going to set up this fashion business. So I started kind of writing a business plan um, during my finals. I told my parents I was going to be an entrepreneur. Um, and then on the day I got my university results, a friend of a friend got in touch with me. Um, 
And he said, I've got an idea for a startup. Do you want to um, co-found it with me? And he said he was looking for someone who could write and edit and knew about audio. And obviously, I'd studied English. And um, I'd done a lot of radio then. So I was kind of the perfect person. Um, so yeah, so he basically had the idea for an audio news app. This was in... I think 2012, um, and you know, founding, leaving university and founding a tech startup was kind of the done cool thing. So um, I thought it was a great opportunity to, to, to kind of enter this tech world. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, um, but we kind of spent our first summer after uni working on it, and by the end of that summer, uh, what was called Clip It News was born. I'm just going to play a quick video, because rather than explain what it is, I thought I'd show you. And also, no one's seen this video for ages, so... I paid for it as well, so I want people to see it. <laughs> The UK is to start buying gas directly from Russia. This is in spite of the EU threatening sanctions over the standoff in Crimea. Palestinian Christians are joining the Israeli army. They argue that military service promotes a national identity and will help Christians and Jews connect through their common histories. The first ever Scottish wine grapes will be harvested this September. Winemakers in Champagne are so worried they've been buying up land in England. Companies are leaving East London's Silicon Roundabout for Berlin's cheap office space, competitive salaries and low living costs. The cost of living in the trendy German capital is almost half the price of a London lifestyle. FIFA have banned Barcelona Football Club. Scotland's predicted to be a future wine hotspot. The initial lineup has been announced for Glastonbury. It's time to open your ears to the news. Right, so yeah, that was Clip It. So it was an audio news app. We, we kind of wrote and recorded one minute audio news clips. We pushed them out to an app that we built and developed in house. And um, very quickly, we grew that to a team of about 20 people. We raised um, some significant investment. Um, we, I was kind of editor-in-chief and co-founder. I had to write a whole new kind of editorial style and handbook with no experience. Um, we had to obviously build, design, and develop the app. I had no experience in that. So I obviously had to learn a lot very quickly. And kind of as you can see here, all kind of blew up quite quickly, I suppose. So um, we got some really good press. We got some really good growth in the early days. I was on the front page of Evening Standard magazine. Um, there I am. Um, and also was like approached by The Guardian. I wrote like a column for them on millennial news habits. I was on BBC News. All of this as a kind of 22, 23-year-old girl. Um, yeah, it was, it was a crazy time and really exciting. But I thought that rather than focus on all the good things about my entrepreneurial career so far, that um, I'd be really honest today and talk about kind of the main challenges. Um, again, going back to that kind of how hard it is being an entrepreneur and running a business. So while all this was going on in the foreground and all my friends were really excited and they thought it was all going really well, um, behind the scenes, um, it was really obviously very hard work. I was incredibly young and new to it. I also had um, like a board of investors and advisors behind the scenes, putting a lot of pressure on myself and my co-founder. Um, more so, I would argue, myself than my co-founder. Um, we'll come on to being a woman in business, but I think that might have had something to do with it. Um, and obviously, I had a team to look after. Um, we had a big money question, like how are we going to monetize Clip It? Um, that was incredibly kind of hard work working on that behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, in the first month, I had to hire and train 15 journalists. Um, anyone who knows about hiring um, knows that it's pretty hard work and intense. And as like a 23-year-old graduate, hiring and training 15 people nearly killed me. Um, and then kind of two and a half years in, when it was all growing, um, it was going well. We had, um, we even had some really big name companies kind of circling us, offering to, to buy us. Um, I was in, you know, chats with Snapchat, um, etc. Um, my co-founder uh, Jimmy decided that he wanted to leave the business and take it in a whole new direction. So he didn't just want to leave; he wanted to split the company in half, and that left me with Clip It and him with kind of half the IP of it. And so suddenly, everything stopped. And one day, I had lots of money in the bank and everything was going really well. 
And then the next day, I had about three weeks of money in the bank, a team of 20 people who were relying on me, and I was left just alone to kind of keep running the show. And I didn't want to give up. I was really, really determined not to, not to give up. So I brought our editor, Sagar, on board as my co-founder, and we gave ourselves three weeks to raise £250,000. Um, we had to rewrite our business plan, our financial model. Um, we had lost all of our investor contacts because they'd all gone with Jimmy, my co-founder. So we had to start literally from scratch. And um, at the same time, keeping the team super motivated. They obviously knew that something was going on, but they didn't know kind of the extent of it. Um, so in three weeks, uh, we pitched to as many people as it was physically possible to do. Is the mic working? Yeah, it's not coming out. Um, we, we pitched as many people as it was possible to, um, and we sent as many applications as we could. Uh, at the end of three weeks, we had money on the table, but we couldn't get the legals done in time, and our runway had run out, and we had to fire our whole team um, at the end of that three weeks. Um, obviously, that was the most horrible thing to do. Lots of tears. Um, it was incredibly stressful. These people kind of were relying on us for their salaries, obviously, and they were really, by this point, super emotionally invested in the company. Um, the day after we fired everyone and we shut our office for the last time, um, we got an email from um, a company in Silicon Valley in California saying, congratulations, you've got through step one of kind of the Silicon Valley incubator program. Um, Sagar and I had completely forgotten that we'd even applied to a tech accelerator in Silicon Valley, um, but it was good news. And so after kind of multiple rounds of interviews, we were accepted onto one of the top tech startup accelerators in Silicon Valley. So in kind of two weeks after we shut the door on the office on Clip It, we got on a plane and I moved to San Francisco. Um, here it is, the glory days. So that's me on my first day um, in San Francisco. So just to give you a brief outline, I don't know if you're familiar with tech startup accelerators, but they're very intensive kind of five, six month programs in Silicon Valley, the tech center of the world. You go there, you grow and scale your idea, and then you pitch to a room full of investors at the end, and you hopefully raise money. It's an incredibly, incredibly intense environment um, and highly competitive because everyone's kind of pitching for the same pool of, of cash. Um, just quickly to run you through these, because I know everyone likes looking at pictures of these kind of things. That's what um, I like. Um, so obviously it's kind of classic, you know, standing desks, motivational posters on the wall. Everyone's got their American college banners. And that's Saga, my co-founder. This is us on our first day. This is us on our last day. Saga lost about three stone through pure stress. <laughs> um, um, this, uh, so now kind of going into the honesty. So on the outside, it looks amazing. Like you're going and you're going to live in Silicon Valley and you've joined this highly competitive startup accelerator. Um, the reality of it is we had no money. We were given £20,000 to go out there and live out there. Um, I don't know if any of you know how expensive living in California is, but it's pretty expensive. As a result, we found on Airbnb a twin windowless room in a pink bungalow in the shadow of the Levi Stadium um, on the outskirts of San Francisco. It was the only thing we could afford. So Saga and I went from being kind of business partners, we didn't really know each other that well, to sharing a twin windowless room <laughs> together and also working with each other every single day. Um, that was our lovely family who we lived with. Uh, the grandparents, that's the grandfather, he didn't speak any English. That was a quite an interesting um, living scenario. Um, we, we did spend a few weeks in a hacker house where we slept in bunk beds with eight other people in a tiny room. Um, they all worked for like Tesla. I've got someone's Tesla jumper on there and Facebook and Google, all of that jazz. Um, and this was one weekend. The weekend we were leaving, actually, they were holding a hackathon there. I think it was probably a good, good time to get out. Um, so yeah, so Silicon Valley, it was great at the beginning. But as time went on, it became increasingly clear to me that I was losing 
interest in what we were doing. We were having to kind of, originally Clip It was all about engaging young people in news. We were creating the content. In Silicon Valley, all they cared about was scale and automation. So we had to change our business completely. And the core kind of ethos that I really cared about was completely lost. Um, but I'm, you know, an entrepreneur by heart and super determined. And that had completely blinded me. So I just had my head down and I was just, you know, going full speed ahead towards this demo day, trying to make what Clipper had become work. And as a result, I got, I got very depressed and anxious, and I had multiple kind of breakdowns um, while I was out in Silicon Valley. Um, and, you know, I kind of blamed being homesick and the pressure of it all. But in reality, it was down to the fact that I'd lost that kind of core passion for what we were doing. Um, and so at the same time, I'd become vegan in California, um, the first week I moved out there, I became vegan. I kind of vowed to myself that I'd do it because it's obviously so easy out there. Become increasingly interested in veganism um, and, and all the vegan businesses that were growing really quickly out there. Um, you can see there, that that's us at the altar of Supreme Master. Um, what's she called? I, does anyone know her name? I can't remember her name. Shanghai, yeah. <laughs> um, that was a funny place. Um, but yeah, so we ate out at vegan restaurants like every weekend and we got really stuck into the vegan scene. So I started to kind of, in the back of my mind, think about, okay, maybe actually I don't want to work in news anymore. I want to set up a vegan business because I really care about this. And I think there's obviously a really great opportunity as well because I could see the growth that was happening in America. And I just knew that London would be like that in three years time. That was three years ago and here we are today. So we're definitely there. Um, so, um, and we got near and near a demo day and we were struggling and struggling and I was struggling mentally and personally. Um, and one day, Sagar, my co-founder and now, you know, a really good friend of mine, sat me down and he said, Grace, you don't have to do this anymore, you know. I know you don't want to do it. And that was the first time that I'd admitted to myself that I didn't want to work in tech or media anymore. And... Honestly, in a second, that all that weight was lifted off my shoulders. I just like smiled. I burst into tears. I was like, "You're right. I don't. I don't want to do it anymore. I want to. I want to." And, and then immediately, I said, "I want to start a vegan food business. That's what I want to do." And I told him, and it felt like I got it off my chest. And he was like, "That's so great because I don't want to work in tech anymore. I hate it here. Let's go home." <laughs> So we then had about, so we did demo day. It was an absolute joke. Like we had like a hundred of Silicon Valley's top tech investors in the room. I got up and did this kind of half assed presentation because we had to do it. Um, and then we like kind of smoothed some investors um, and then left very early um, to go and eat more vegan food probably and then ran away. So our business is still open in Silicon Valley. I hope there's no US investors here. Um, <laughs> We took what little money there was left um, and came back to London. And together we started uh, what would become Spicebox. So Spicebox, um, I'd had this idea for a while of a, you know, a really great, vibrant, fresh, slightly healthier Indian takeout delivery service out of my own frustration when I was living in London. I loved Indian food. Um, I go to India a lot, I cook a lot of Indian food, but I can never find that really good kind of homely, nutritious Indian food. It was all kind of junk. Um, and then obviously being a new vegan and wanting to work in vegan food, it was a really obvious connection that I put them two together. Um, so we came up with Spicebox, we were working on it a bit in America. That was uh, our first ever logo. Um, it's terrible, I'm so glad we didn't stick with it. So this, we got back in about November. In December, we put a table in my front door and we started selling curries from my front door. So I would cook in the kitchen and then we'd just sell them out the front door. Um, I signed up to some um, kind of new delivery apps that were happening then, like Quick Up, which still exists, and Take It Easy, which has since gone bust. And I'd stay in every night, um, every single night, seven days a week. I'd cook curry and I'd sit by an iPad waiting to see if there was an order. Most nights there were no orders. Sometimes neighbours would come and knock on my door and ask me for a curry and I'd run and heat it up and give it to them. Sometimes I'd get some orders. Uh, weirdly, most of them from like West London on Quick Up. People pay like £20 just to get it delivered, which is strange. Um, but it goes without saying that this period... You know, it was fun and it was great and it's all about what starting a company is about, but it was really, really hard. Like, I'd come from, you know, 
um, like young entrepreneurs to watch 2015, um, kind of height of the London tech startup scene, then moving to Silicon Valley in America, and then I literally got back to London, I was back to square one, just like ground zero. My friends were like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm starting a curry business. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, so it was emotionally incredibly hard because, you know, my parents were just like, what are you doing, Grace? Just get a proper job. You're never going to succeed selling curry out your front door. Um, I had no money. Um, at this point, Sagar had lost the will to live. He was like, I do not care about food this much. I'm off. <laughs> so I was by myself. That's my mum. Um, so yeah, I was cooking curry um, from my home, and then I applied for Druid Street Market, which was this kind of slightly trendy food market in um, Bermondsey um, that I thought would be a good kind of entry point. Um, it was quite hard to get into, but I thought our food was good enough for us to be accepted onto it. So I started there in February, um, which is like for anyone that's done street food is just the worst idea ever, but it was the only way I could get a pitch. So I'd turn up in the freezing cold, we'd sell about 20 curries. I'd have to put that whole rig up myself, take it down. Um, I was cooking all the food at this point in my kitchen. My house was like a curry factory. I had white wooden floor and it's just still covered in turmeric from, from them. Um, Again, like we had like a mouse, serious mouse problem, which wasn't great. Um, my flatmate moved out because she couldn't deal with the curry smell. So I was alone, even more alone. Um, and obviously, like my mum helped me out loads. That's really great. And a few of my friends helped me out. But really, like it was a horrible time. And there were lots of tears and a lot of like, what am I doing with my life? Um, all my friends have real jobs and salaries. Um, my boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, had to take the brunt of it but slowly by slowly like despite everything I had this this just underlying like knowledge it wasn't a belief and it wasn't a faith it was just a knowledge like I was like this is going to work I just know it's going to work and so even when you know it's a daily daily struggle um I just had this kind of just this simmering kind of this is going to work just keep going one foot in front of the other and that's, I think, that is the kind of the key part of being an entrepreneur. It's you can be as much of an emotional wreck as you want. You can have the least kind of confidence in yourself on a surface level. Uh, you don't have to be really clever or like, you know, really bold and uh, talkative. You just have to have this core little fire constantly burning in you that doesn't go out that you really believe in what you're doing. And I had that. And so I st slowly started to, to get somewhere. Um, so after Druid Street, Curb approached us, and we're looking for a, a kind of healthy-ish Indian offering, also a vegan offering. Do you want to come and join us? So I took that. Um, I had to start employing people. I bought a gazebo and a street food setup. I eventually moved production out of my home kitchen into a commercial kitchen a couple of days a week. People started to kind of try our food, get to know us. Then that summer, this was still a few months in, for some reason, I have no idea why, Time Out decided that we were like one of the best street food dishes in London. And that was kind of the start of it, really. One of the journalists had come to George Street and tried our korma and really liked it. And so we got listed out of the 50 street food traders in London, we got listed as like number nine and about three months in to doing street food. And everyone was a bit kind of, you know, snarky about it. But, <laughs> um, but you know, we've gone up two places since, so it was legit. Um, and, then, and then, so then we started to do festivals and street food and slowly kind of building up a presence, people trying our food, getting feedback from the food. Street food is obviously a really good testing ground for a business idea. Um, and obviously, while that was happening, we went from being the second only vegan trader at Curb after Club Mexicana. Obviously, now there are loads. So the vegan movement was really growing then. Um, and then I started, I made a decision, I was, I'd obviously raise money investment with Clipper. I kind of knew that world, I understood it. Um, I'd done it with a male co-founder before, um, but I decided that I wanted to, to raise money for Spicebox because um, I had a really big vision. I'd always had this vision from, from day one, that kind of, that fire I was talking about. So I started kind of February 
last year um, to actively go out and seek investment. Um, we can talk about this more in Q&A if you're more interested in it. Um, but that was a real, that was a real, real struggle. That was equivalent of kind of going back to square one because I had this kind of on the outside. It was, you know, a really exciting street for business. business. We got loads of press. We had loads of awards. Um, but still, obviously, on the inside, I was equally as kind of insecure and unsure about where it was going. Um, but obviously, raising money is, is like doing a play and being an actress and putting on this front of bravado and um, convincing people that, you know, you've got an idea that's worth putting money into. And I genuinely believed I did, obviously, but you really have to kind of project that confidence. So I met with, you know, it was a very long drawn out process, but hundreds of emails, drinks with random people that you went to school with in the hope that like they know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone um, who might know someone who'd be interested in investing. Um, and I finally, after a lot of hard work, a lot of financial modeling and business plans, etc., cetera, um, raised some money in October. Um, and with the view to taking Spicebox from kind of street food and festivals to like a chain of Indian delivery and takeaway sites. So we're hopefully launching our first proper site in London um, over the next few months. Fingers crossed, touch wood. Um, which is exciting. Um, and yeah, I mean, now we've got a team of about five core people. Um, we've launched a delivery kitchen and the future is looking really exciting. Um, it's great. But again, coming back to what it's like being an entrepreneur, it's still a daily struggle <laughs> and it's still really stressful and it really takes its toll. Um, I don't know how all of you kind of, if you do run businesses, how you cope with it. I started meditating recently. It's changed my life. I can deal with it and I can function like a, a, a human being. But without that, I honestly don't know where I'd be right now. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of kind of the emotional strain. I'm sure the other speakers will agree. Like, no matter how good it's going, it's always going to be terrible to you. <laughs> You're always going to find the negatives. And it's obviously incredibly important to keep step stepping back and taking note of where you've come. But that's realistically not going to happen. So you just, you need to kind of be prepared for that. It's just going to take over your life and be, it will be a constant, constant battle. Um, I'm going to speed up a bit because I want to have some questions. So here we are. Any questions? Do I have any time? No, no time. Shit, I talked too long. Sorry. Um, maybe come up to me afterwards and ask me questions. I don't know. I haven't taught you anything. Okay. Bye.